This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Hey guys, Jesse here. Today, I'm gonna be building a mosaic Damascus Chinese cleaver. I've never made anything quite like it, so stay tuned to see how it turns out. Look at how bent that is. That's honestly kind of impressive. I'm starting off a little bit different than all my other Damascus patterns. I'm cutting my bars into six inch pieces rather than four inch pieces. Imagine how long that would have taken with a with an angle render. One of the reasons that I wanted to start off with more steel is because mosaic Damascus generally requires many more forge welds than other kinds of Damascus. For this pattern, I think I'm going to have to do five to six separate forge welds, and every single forge weld means a loss in material due to scale or cutting off the dirty ends. Oh my gosh. As you can see on my iPad here, I actually have the entire pattern already planned out. I know what I'm going to do for every separate forge weld. But the thing is, I am not a master of mosaic just yet. I'm actually not a master of anything. So my drawing could be very different from what I actually get. Because this is a mosaic, this first forge weld is so important. If any weld flaw makes itself into the billet when I'm drawing it out, it's going to get magnified a hundredfold later on. What you see me doing here is everything in my power to ensure that that won't happen. I'm grinding the faces to the same level, I'm welding the side pieces so they don't bow out, and later on I'm going to dip the entire billet in some quench oil so that I get that nice thick layer of soot to ensure that no oxygen can get in between the pieces. One funny thing about the bladesmithing community is that everybody has their own processes that work in their own way. One example of this is just simply setting up the Damascus billet. There's a couple bladesmiths that don't clean off the rust or any of the pickling before they stack them. There's also people that clean everything meticulously, wash everything with acetone. And the thing is, even though their processes are so different, the end result that they get is usually pretty similar. So it doesn't mean that one person is right and one person is wrong. Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. According to this chart provided by YouTube, most of you guys are above the age of 24. So it's probably a good idea for me to explain what a VPN does. Whenever you surf the web, anyone can come in and see your data, especially on public Wi-Fi. There's very little shielding, very little encryption, nothing. What Surfshark does is they act as the middleman for your data. They encrypt it before anyone can come in and steal it. This all comes with a pretty useful side effect. You can set your location to be anywhere a VPN server is. If you want to watch the show Fierce Creatures from 1997 on Netflix, and you're in the US, you can set your server to be the UK, and there it is. You're basically a phantom, teleporting around the world to suit your own selfish needs. If that all sounds enticing, and you want to start protecting your internet experience, Surfshark has a special holiday offer for you. If you use the code JESSEHU at the link in the description, you get up to six months of VPN service for free, and free is the best price possible, so you should do it. Thank you, Surfshark, and now back to the video. After setting the initial welds on my first billet, I'm actually gonna be doing something that I have never shown on this channel. I'm gonna be using my homemade squaring dies and forging down the corners of the billet. What this does to the pattern is it drags those outer pieces sort of closer to the center, so that later on when I go to stack it, it'll look like a bunch of Ws rather than a bunch of straight lines. Thinking about it now, I'm actually amazed that these squaring dies have made it this far. I've used them on around three or four separate projects now, and they haven't shown any signs of wanting to fall apart. Once I'm done with the squaring dies, it's back to the flat dies to draw this billet out to a fairly long length. I want to be able to cut it into at least six separate sections. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll probably be surprised to hear that I haven't complained about the temperature at all yet. And that's because I'm filming this in December, and in Arizona, it's only 60 to 70 degrees, which is kind of perfect. Once the billet is about two feet long, I take it over to the anvil, and I straighten it a little bit, but then I take it back to the press on the big flat thighs, and I get it perfectly straight. With the billet all forged out, and pretty much perfectly straight, it's time to let it cool in some still air.
Usually at this point in the process, I would put the billet in the post vise and I would take an angle grinder to it to get off the scale. But I actually have a new tool that's perfect for this job. And that's my surface grinding attachment from Beaumont Metalworks. Before I use it though, I mark all the pieces so that I know which order that I cut them in. The belt that I'm using is a slightly worn 80 grit belt and I'm only taking passes of around five thousandths of an inch at a time. This is my first time using the surface grinder and I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. With all the welding surfaces now clean, I take it over to a 120 grit belt on the flat platen so that I could get the pieces ready for a test etch. This test etch is actually pretty important because it ensures that my pieces are oriented correctly. I know that I already marked the pieces earlier, but five extra minutes is a really small price to pay for 100% confirmation. Oh yeah, perfectly lined up. Now that all the pieces are oriented correctly and perfectly clean, I weld together my second billet for my second forge weld. One funny thing that happened off camera is that I accidentally flipped one of those pieces 180 degrees. And because the pieces aren't symmetrical, it actually makes a difference. This is what I like to call a happy accident because even though it's objectively a mistake, it made the pattern look cooler in the end. So I'm not gonna stress too much about it. The next step for this pattern isn't simply to just draw it out and cut and stack it. It's actually to make it into a square and then re-square it. This will tilt the pattern 45 degrees and make it a lot more interesting to look at. My goal for re-squaring was to have it at a perfect 45 degrees. But if you're looking at it from this angle, it actually looks like my billet wasn't even square in the first place. So I think I ended up tilting it 43 or 44 degrees. This didn't end up changing too much, but this would be one of the things that separates me from say a master smith. A master smith would have much better angle control and they wouldn't have something like this pop up. If you've been following my channel since this summer, you'll probably realize that I haven't posted in four months. That's because I've been studying out of state at the University of Michigan trying to get my electrical engineering degree. It's definitely a lot of fun to be at school, but that's not to say that I didn't miss this a whole lot. Back to the task at hand, you can see that I put some stops into the press. That's because I want to forge this out into a long square bar. The next step is to actually cut it into four pieces and do something called a four-way weld. I don't know if you heard it, but there was this really weird sound coming from my press right when I was about to finish drawing out the bar. At this point, I still don't know what it is, but all I know is that turning it on and off fixed the entire thing. If you look super closely, you'll see the piece that I accidentally flipped around. After I cut the billet into four equal sized pieces, it's time for another test etch. This test etch is pretty crucial because I can sort of arrange this billet in any way that I want. These pieces aren't exactly 100% symmetrical, so I can sort of play with the layout and create a new pattern. Let's get this shit surface ground. Because this is a four-way weld, only two of the four sides of each piece need to be cleaned up. This is one of those things that helps me save a little bit of extra material every forge weld. And that compounds and leaves me with a lot more steel than I would have otherwise. With the forge heating up again, it's time to throw the squaring dies back onto the press. Because this is a four-way weld, and I need to put pressure in two different axes, the squaring dies are the best dies to set the weld with. Like always, the first welding pass is really quick, and I don't want the billet to lose much heat at all. After this first pass, I let it sit in the forge and soak for a little bit longer than usual because I want some good cross-boundary green growth. Because the goal for this pattern isn't for it to be a traditional explosion pattern, I'm actually going to be re-squaring it again. 
this will make the pattern go from something like this to something like this. This forge weld is very similar to the last one, so I'm not going to show you too much of it. But as you can see here, I'm forging it on the bias, resquaring it, and drawing it out back into a square bar. It's a lot of steel for one knife. Oh my god, I got it exactly. That is, that is one line, that is not two lines. I'm kind of a genius. With this next test etch, you can really start to see what the final pattern is gonna look like. What do I think about this? I think... I am terrible at judging 45 degrees. I'm always off by like two or three degrees. After finding an orientation of the pieces that I like, it's time to take it back to the welder and weld up my third to last billet. Every single weld that I've done on this channel so far has been with a Lincoln Flux Core welder. I swear that this summer I'm gonna get myself an actual good MIG welder. I'm honestly kind of sick of throwing disgusting beads purely because my welder is just not that good. All I have to do for this billet is to draw it out and get it ready to cut up into another four pieces for the final four way. Alright, this is the final test etch for this pattern. Oh yeah! The final step for this pattern is one more four way weld. Because this is the final forge weld, I'm taking a little bit of extra care on this forge weld than compared to the other four ways. I'm actually going to be running a weld bead around the entire billet rather than just the sides. This means I'll have to grind it off later, but it'll ensure that I get perfect forge welds. As you can see here, I didn't set this with the squaring dies, but because I welded around the entire billet, there's a little bit less chance of it falling apart on me, so I'm just using the big flat dies. After two or three heats of gentle drawing out, I take it over to the post vise and I use an angle grinder to grind out all of that MIG weld. Because I'm going to be cutting this into tiles later, and because Chinese cleavers are known for how wide they are, I actually need to make sure that this billet is very rectangular by the time I'm done with it. I think the dimensions were around 2.5 inches wide by 1.5 inches thick. With the billet finalized, it's time to let it cool down slowly overnight in a bucket of Merculite. This will make sure that it is super soft and ready to be cut into tiles. I want a 35 degree angle, which means this has to be at 125. To cut the tiles, I set the angle of cut on the bandsaw to be 35 degrees. The only reason that I needed that 125 degree angle is because I had to draw the lines on the billet itself. I don't know what to expect. This test etch is on the very end of the bar, so it's a little bit distorted, but as you can see, it looks quite good. This is actually a perfect time for me to explain why we need to tile in the first place. This is, what, this is what we had going to the vermiculite. What we're doing is cutting tiles so that we expose the pattern on the inside of the tiles. And then we're flipping them and welding them together so that we get a billet that looks like this with the pattern showing on the outside. This is what the top down view looks like after the tile weld. This is what it would look like if we did no tile weld. Just a bunch of lines. As I was cutting the tiles, I realized that there'd be no way for me to grip the billet in the vise as I was cutting the last tile, so I welded on a sacrificial piece of steel so that I could cut that last tile. One, two, three, four, five. Because I already surface ground the billet, there's only a couple faces that I had to clean up on the grinder. The belt that I used for this was a really dull 120 grit belt. The last thing that I had to do before I could actually do the tile weld was to ensure that all of these tiles were the exact same height. I decided to do this on the surface grinder, but honestly, the best way to do this is just to make sure that you cut them to the same thickness at the start. What I'm doing here is I'm cutting some sheets of sacrificial sheet steel. These will sort of be the bread of the mosaic Damascus sandwich. These will help ensure that no oxygen gets into the billet when I weld it.
It's probably pretty obvious from how I'm wielding it, but this is the first time I've ever used a sheet metal cutter. Every other time, I've just used an angle grinder, because that's what I've had. I actually want these pieces of sheet steel to weld themselves to the mosaic, so I'm taking them over to the grinder and I'm cleaning them off with a dull 80 grit belt. To set up my mosaic Damascus sandwich, so to speak, I first tack every single tile so that they're as close to each other as I can get them, and then I actually use the welder and I weld around the entire billet. Every single seam is going to be covered in welds. This way, zero oxygen can get into my billet. Obviously, because I welded around the entire billet already, there was no point in me dipping it in the quench oil here, but honestly, it just acts as a really nice backup for if I left a gap in the weld and I needed something to stop the oxygen from getting in. I'm trying to baby this weld. I want to treat it like it's going to fall apart at any moment, so I take one light pass and then I throw it right back in the forge for a really long soak. With the forge welds now pretty much set, I take it over to the post vise and I grind off every single little bit of weld I can find on the side. I do not want some mild steel to be in my edge. With the sides of the billet now clean, it was time to draw it out a little bit more and then get it ready to actually start forging the blade. The billet was pretty solid for the most part, but there was this one problem area where one of the corners of the tiles didn't really want to weld. And so I took it over to the grinder and I ground through that little D lamp. This is going to be eight to eight and a half inch blade. Although now that I'm looking at it, eight and a half is kind of long for a cleaver. So I think I'm gonna do eight inches. All right. It might look like cheating when I cut off material that I don't need, but honestly, this material is so time consuming to make and so valuable that I didn't want to risk forging down a tank for it. Now to cut off that small rectangular section, I could have probably just used an angle grinder, but I was looking at the side of my bandsaw and I realized there was actually a table. So I hooked it up and I just turned into essentially a porta band. Just a bit of cleanup. To make the integral bolsters on this blade, I'm going to be doing a technique that I learned from Salem Straub in Washington, and that is making forge welded bolsters. This is a tile of the same mosaic that I made the blade out of, and what I'm doing here is I'm grinding it into a really nice rectangle that later I can cut into two and forge weld onto the blade. One of the defining features of a Chinese cleaver is just how wide it is. The billet that I was working with was only two and a half inches wide at this point, so I had to find a way to creatively give it an entire extra inch of width. I definitely made a mistake there, and I tried to draw out the entire blade at once, and that actually kind of messed up two of the tile welds. So I flexed it up, took it to a hand hammer, and re-closed those forge welds. It'll actually be a recurring theme, because those two forge welds at the edge were really finicky, and I had to keep going back, flux them, hammer them, fix the forge welds, and then draw it out more. I discovered that the best method of giving this blade its width was simply a cross peen hammer. The press is good and all, but it's overkill. It's like trying to kill a bird with a cannonball, and I don't even know if the cannonball will hit the bird. I see a lot of comments asking me what Flux does. Flux actually does a multitude of things, the first of which is forming a glassy layer around the steel so that the stuff underneath can't oxidize. The second most important is that it liquefies scale, so it can sort of repair broken forge welds. It can seep into that d lamb, liquefy the scale, and then later you can just blast it out with a hand hammer. The thing about Flux though is that it actually eats through the side of your forge, so I only try to use it when I'm trying to fix the forge weld as opposed to when I'm setting it in the first place. Sanding this is going to take seven years. 
With the blade mostly forged to shape, it was time to straighten out that tang and get ready to forge weld my bolsters. The bolster material is pretty much ready, all I have to do is cut it in half with a bandsaw. Before I can forge weld the bolsters to the blade, I have to make sure to grind through all of that sheet metal on the side of the blade. I also have to make sure that those contact areas are as flat as possible. I do not want any oxygen to get in between my bolsters and the blade. You start seeing the pattern around like here, but there's still stuff I have to grind through here and all on this side. Once I ensured that I had clean material on clean material, I took it over to my welder and I just tacked those bolsters on. I didn't weld all the way around, all I did was tack it. I know that earlier I mentioned that I didn't want to use too much flux, but these bolsters kind of have to be forge welded perfectly. So I flux them and I dip the entire thing in oil. For all of the forge welding, I just used the hand hammer. I didn't want to use the press because anything trapped in between would just get stuck there if I were to use the press. With the bolsters pretty much welded on, it was time to take it to the press, draw out the tang, and then that's pretty much it for the forging. After the tang, I took a couple heats to finalize the profile on my blade and make sure that everything was straight. For this knife, I'm actually going straight into the kiln right out of the forge. I didn't even bother to take it to the grinder and profile it a little bit. I haven't ground really deep at all, but those forge welds look pretty perfect. The cool thing about this blade is that there's actually a set point for the rough grinding. The blade is still covered in a fairly thin layer of sheet steel, but for the quench, I want all of that off. I do not want any mild steel on the sides. Mild steel actually acts very different than high carbon steel in the quench. The high carbon steel actually gains a small percent of volume and the mild steel just stays the same. This makes it so that if the outside is clad in mild steel and the inside is high carbon steel, the inside will want to expand past the outside, and this can actually crack the entire blade down the center, and this has happened to me before. It's probably not showing on my face because I actually have a pretty decent poker face, but I was actually really stressed going into this quench. At this point, I had put four days of work into the blade, and if anything cracked in the quench, I would have to completely restart. And I actually have a deadline for this video, so I would have to work at double speed for the next five days. I think I may have outdone myself with this one. After file testing the blade for hardness, I chuck it into a small toaster oven at around 350 degrees for a quick flash temper. The reason that I need a quick flash temper is because the kiln actually takes around two hours to cool down, and those two hours where the knife is just left sitting outside could be the difference between developing a crack and not. Directly after heat treat, <laughs> we're at two pounds. Thus began the incredibly long process of grinding this blade to its final shape. As you saw before, the blade was around 2 pounds. 2 pounds is much too heavy, and that means the blade is much too thick. The end weight for this knife is around a pound total, including the handle. The blade actually developed a very minor warp in the quench, so what I'm doing here is I'm using a carbide ball peen hammer to straighten it a little bit. 
Michelangelo said, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. When knife making, the only thing that you can really do is take away material. This means I have to be sort of creative when deciding what material to take off. My blade can be globally straight, but have many ripples throughout the entire blade. It is my job to grind the humps of those off and leave a center line that is perfectly straight. One thing that can happen when I'm grinding the blade is that it can actually warp. There's a lot of internal stresses in the steel, and by grinding off material, you expose them and let them have their way. This means I have to constantly be checking the straightness of the blade and whether there's a corkscrew, a potato chip, a Pringle, whatever you want to call it. I have to be super careful that this blade, when it gets straight, it stays straight. Listen to the steel sing. Because this knife also has an integral bolster, I have to be wary of the two planes that connect the bolster to the blade. To make my life easier later, I'm also going to the transition between the bolster and the tang, and I'm cleaning it up as best as I can without a file guide. Point six six wide, point two two thick. Where's my 15 64th? This block of wood costs the same as all of the metal for this combined. It was $160. If you know a knife maker, the best thing to get them for basically any occasion is just a new block of handle material. It's basically almost an addiction. Whenever I see a block of wood on Instagram, there's a part of me that's considering buying it. All I'm doing here is scribing lines on my handle block so that I have something to look at when I'm drilling the holes. I don't have a mill yet, so this is the best I can do. <laughs> Two sick kicks. All right, what's the correct drill speed for this? I don't have any second chances with this material, so... Apparently 1550. <laughs> Because I don't have a mill and I'm using regular drill bits, I have to be a little bit wary about the drill bits wandering. For the first hole, it doesn't really matter too much because there isn't much to wander. But when I'm drilling the second and third holes adjacent to the first one, I have to take super small bites to make sure that it doesn't accidentally wander back into the first. With the handle block drilled and ready to be fit to the tang, it was time to start thinking about the spacer. The material that I'm using is a sheet of silicon bronze that I got from Blade Show Atlanta this year. It is honestly a pretty nice material to work with, and I have so much of it, and it looks so nice, so it was a no-brainer to use for this build. A while ago, I read a comment from someone saying that Oh, you have all those big machines, but you don't have any blue dicum. I've actually put blue dicum into my Amazon cart three or four times. I just keep forgetting to actually purchase it. So for now, I'm just gonna stick with good old permanent marker and the loss of a couple brain cells. Handle's done. So it turns out my tang isn't centered to the bolster. So this is now too small. So I need to make a new one. I made it sound like it was a lot of work to redo, but it only took me around 15 minutes. Because my tang is fairly rectangular, I have to get this slot to a rectangular shape. And that means a lot of file work. I was using small round files, small diamond files, everything in my arsenal to get this thing fit to the tang. I can get this to fit right now. All right, let's give this thing a whirl. The, the tiny file guide, that's bigger than my head. 
If you're wondering what the file guide does, it basically allows me to have a super flat plane that I can grind against. The file guide has two tungsten carbide faces that are basically untouchable with a file or a grinding belt. That makes the file guide a really nice hard stop so that I can grind directly against it and nothing further. Look at that fit up. You probably can't tell on the camera, but uh, that's pretty dang good. With the spacer now fit up perfectly to the back of the bolster, it was time to turn my attention back to the handle block. What I'm doing here is I'm using some sideways pressure on that same drill bit just to combine the three holes that I drilled earlier. This is actually kind of dangerous because drill bits aren't really designed to handle that sideways pressure, but this is by far the fastest method that I had of combining those holes. The next step was to use a pair of homemade brooches to sort of rectangularize that rounded out slot. Whoa, why, why is this going so fast? And why am I bleeding? If I were to be Frank, I would have to change my name. I wonder what percentage of my viewers would actually laugh at a joke like that. This is actually a cool trick that I learned on how to find the, the contact spots in the handle block. Basically, I cover the tang and permanent marker and I look for the spots that are rubbed off by the handle block. Ah, we're contacting on the sides. Okay. To save some time later, and possibly some of this handle material, I mark off parts that I know that I'm not gonna use in the handle, and I take them to the bandsaw and just lop them off. One of the biggest things on my shop bucket list is a really nice shop-wide dust collection system. As of right now, whenever I grind wood or cut it on the bandsaw, I throw wood dust everywhere and that actually reaches as far as the entrance of the garage. Oh yeah. Usually for my order of operations, I don't shape the handle at all until the entire thing is epoxied and attached to the blade permanently. This time, however, I wanted to try something a little bit different. I don't actually know if one is better than the other, but I would never know until I actually try it the other way. flex it with my finger and it's a cleaver so there's so much material next to it and I can still bend it I show how thin it is I think I'm gonna finalize the handle shape after I glue it and after I hand sand the blade to hopefully make my life a little bit easier when I go to hand sand the blade I take up the entire thing to a 400 grit machine finish For such a big knife, less than a pound is pretty good. And this is still gonna get smaller. Hand sanding this blade took about as long as you would expect. And then you multiply that time by about four. The entire blade was three and a half inches wide and the blade itself was eight and a half inches long. Not to mention that the entire blade was around 62 to 63 HRC. All right, I think I could finally flip it. Oh. oh, this stuff smells terrible, but it's so good at what it does. While I was hand sanding, I decided to rewatch some of the YouTube classics with respect to knife making. I rewatched Alex Steele's entire chef knife series, the one with like 20 million views or something. And then I also rewatched Kyle Royer's Mosaic Damascus sword build. Apart from knife making videos though, I actually had enough time to fit in 10 full episodes of Community. I think I want to put this on here. This is sacrilege of the highest order. Wait, I don't have a knife. What is this made of? The idea behind attaching this little piece of leather to my hand sanding stick was that the leather was softer than the file itself, so it would give a little bit more give to the sandpaper. What was that, nine hours? 
With the entire blade now at 150 grit finish, it was time to go to 400 and then 600 grit. I'm not going to bore you with too much more hand sanding footage, but for 400 grit, I went at a diagonal angle as opposed to parallel to the blade, and then for 600 grit, I went back to parallel to the blade. The last thing that I had to take note of was how clean my transition between the blade and the front of the bolster was. I mentioned it in my last chef's knife video, but that transition is so easily overlooked, but it just adds a level of depth to the piece that I wouldn't have otherwise. Okay, I lied. There's one more thing I have to take note of, and that's the spine. On a mosaic Damascus piece like this, it's actually really important to have the spine have a high polish because there's actually a really cool pattern that you see on the top and bottom of the blade. With my maker's mark now entirely etched into the blade, it was time to darken it with some perma blue from Birchwood Casey. Here I'm just cleaning off everything that's not the maker's mark with another piece of 600 grit sandpaper. It's important that I don't go too hard or else I'll get rid of the darkening. For the glue up, I had to make sure that every single surface that I would glue is either cleaned with acetone, blown with compressed air, or just degreased. This is super important because I am not really going to have a mechanical connection for this handle. The only thing holding the handle onto the blade is some 24 hour West System Epoxy. Now, West System Epoxy is ridiculously strong. Like, really freaking strong. So, I don't really have to worry too much about it, but I don't want to give it an excuse to give out, say, like a decade down the line. I made the mistake here of accidentally turning the blade blade side down, which means I had some epoxy drip downward and onto the blade. I had a little bit more cleanup with acetone to do later, but it wasn't too big of a deal. I let the epoxy sit for a full 24 hours to cure. I didn't want to touch it early at all. After letting the epoxy cure entirely, it was time to start shaping the handle. My client actually requested that I leave the handle a little thicker than I would otherwise. I actually kind of agree because the cleaver is three and a half inches tall and that means any force exerted on the edge will apply a little bit more torque than say on a two inch wide kitchen knife. I kept that in mind as I shaped the entire handle. Even though the wood that I use for the handle is ridiculously dense and super oily, I didn't want to get it wet when I was grinding it. So whenever I was grinding the bolster and it heated up a lot, I just let it sit on some aluminum blocks so that it could suck out the heat a little bit faster than just letting it sit in still air. My handle faceting routine is probably a little bit less refined than most other makers. I kind of just take down the corners and I play with the angles until I find something that both looks good and feels good. Because of the way that I shape my handles, they kind of look big and blocky until the very last couple of passes on the grinder. I have come to be able to see past that and sort of see the final destination of the handle, but it's still kind of weird to watch back this footage and wonder what I was thinking when I was shaping it, because it does kind of look disgusting right now. The central facet on the front of my bolsters I wanted to be perpendicular to the spine of the blade itself, and in order to reference off the spine, I had to take off that temporary sheath. That meant that there were a couple times when I was grinding this handle that I could have just entirely ruined the blade. If I slipped and had the blade fall into the grinding belt, it, it was actually pretty doomed. With the handle shaped, it was time to fix up a couple imperfections in the wood itself. I filled these small blemishes and little cracks with black super glue. 
Oops, I missed. Now, even though I'm pretty good with the grinder, there's still stuff to be cleaned up with the hand file. The entire handle is going to be at least a 600 grit finish, and the wood maybe even like 1500 grit. I think by the time I was done with this blade, I had spent 18 hours in that disgusting white chair. My back was pretty sore, I think my nerd neck got one degree worse, it, it was just bad. My bad. What did you even trip on? Once the entire handle was at a good 600 grit finish, I took the 600 grit sandpaper and I broke some of the corners. Some of the facets were so sharp that they actually hurt to hold in your hand. Speaking of sharp angles hurting your hand though, I made sure that the choil of this cleaver was very, very smooth. I broke the corners at a 45 degree angle and then I rounded the corners of that 45 degree angle. And then once that was done, I cleaned up the blade flats again with 600 grit sandpaper so that I could get the entire thing ready for etch. I used some regular electrical tape to cover the wood for the etch. I don't even know if ferric chloride eats into the wood, but I didn't want to take any chances here. Before the etch, I made sure to wash the entire blade with just regular dish soap. I actually did this twice to ensure that there was no oil left on the blade. Oh my god! My process for further bringing out this pattern is the same as everybody else that's ever done Damascus. I take off all the oxides with a high grit sandpaper, in my case 2500 grit, and then I re-etch it. I make sure to get all of the surfaces on the bolster as well. With everything polished up again, it's time to wash it with some more dish soap and then give it another two minutes in the ferric chloride. You'll be able to see that there's a lot more contrast already but this finish isn't the final finish that I'm gonna be looking for. The thing about the ferric finish is that it actually rubs off. That is why I do the coffee etch later. The coffee etch leaves a dark black oxide that is actually very durable. On the second cycle, I use a 5,000 grit sanding pad on top of the 2,500 grit sandpaper. This is just to give the steel a little bit extra polish. That is, and that is not enough coffee. Oops. Remember that accident that I did at the beginning where I turned one of those W's the other way? Because of that, at the center of every one of these petals, it's darker. So now there's a gradient in every single flower petal. With the blade entirely etched now, it's time to polish the handle and then it's basically finished. I'm honestly really proud of myself for managing to finish this entire build within the span of only 9 days. 
this is one of the most complicated pieces that I've ever made. It has the most complicated Damascus. It has the most complicated construction. I've never done forge welded bolsters by myself. I've only done it under the guidance of Salem Straub. So I was really proud that I managed to pull that off on my own as well. With the handle polished and the coffee etch now permanently set, it was time to go over the blade with a little bit of sunshine cloth. This wipes off that little bit of brown residue left by the coffee and leaves only pure white and pure dark colors. Like all knives that leave my shop, I have to give them a razor sharp edge. Here I'm using a 400 grit Atoma diamond stone to get that edge to zero. And then later I use a 3000 grit Chosera water stone to give it its final edge. And then obviously I followed up with a strop. Make sure to click the link in the description for up to six months of EPN service for free.